Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus, praying that as we gather this morning that truly it would be all about you. I pray, Lord, that we would set every sin that hinders us aside, and that we would find ourselves in a place where we're able to receive what your Spirit is saying to the church. I pray even now, Lord Jesus, that you would set me aside, Lord, so that people would rather see you and hear your words rather than this man that's in front of this pulpit. So I pray, Lord, that you guide us through the hearing of your word, that you guide us by your spirit, so that your word would make itself firmly implanted within our hearts and that we would leave this place a people who are new, made new. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, our emphasis this year is the importance of prayer, our, our prayer life. With this focus comes the want of reigniting a passion to draw close to God, to draw close to Jesus relationally. I look at this focus on prayer this year at this time in this place in history of our church as providentially placed. It's no coincidence that we here at Foth have turned our question, excuse me, turned our focus to questions such as, is my relationship with Jesus relational or transactional? Have I made God out to be a genie in a bottle only to be picked up and rubbed every once in a while to go ahead and grant me a wish? Is my relationship with Jesus based on convenience and need rather than genuine love for God? Questions such as, have I truly understood what it's meant to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's not coincidental that we began this year focusing on prayer life, because it's a discussion I believe the Lord has impressed on the church today. He has impressed it upon the world today. And he's impressed it on each and one of us individually. Are we listening? For the past couple of months, I've seen an increase of focus on prayer, not only here in our church, but also in other churches. And for the last month, I've seen an increase of media attention turning to things of Christianity, where CNN... Fox News, all the major networks, the social networks, Facebook, Twitter, the only thing I'm seeing is Jesus this, Jesus that, prayer this, prayer that. Some people have called this a revival. If that wasn't enough, it just so happens that this place in time, this place in our church history, this place in time in our nation, that there would just happen to be this movie that would come out in the past two weeks, speaking of a modern day revival. You can't plan this out. You can't make this up. Coincidence? 
I believe God is using these things to grab our attention. Are you listening? How's your prayer life? How's your relationship with God? Revival. Revival, they say. Some in the church are excited and others skeptical. I want to be honest with you. I lean on the skeptical side. Let me say that again. I leaned on the skeptical side. Notice I, I leaned past tense, meaning I'm not skeptical anymore. What helped me move past my skepticism was looking to God, asking him, is this really you? I'm asking him. I'm looking to his scriptures, searching for answers. So before we even get to the message today, I want to invite you to a place where God corrected me. So I'm going to just lay myself bare to you before we get to the message. Turn with me to Luke chapter 9 and verse 50. Luke chapter 9 and verse 50. This is what it said. Jesus said to him, do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is what? For you. For context's sake, let's, let me give you the flow of this discussion. Uh, there was an argument that broke out between the disciples. Who's the greatest? The I'm better than you attitude. It's the up one-manship, the attitude we're all accustomed to, where we have the desire to be the greatest, the best. It's our natural inclination. We want the intention. We want to be the focus. We want center stage. And Jesus knew the heart of the disciples as they were having this argument. So Jesus took a child by the hand and brought him close. The action itself of Jesus bringing this child close took upon so much significance. You see, culturally, in Jesus' time, the rabbis would ignore the children. And it was considered foolishness even to talk with a child. So imagine with me, you have the disciples fighting, arguing who's the greatest, and Jesus took the least in the eyes of society and brought them close to him. The lesson began with the action. There you are, far off, arguing who's the greatest, while Jesus takes the least and brings them close by. After this action, listen to the word of Jesus. He said this in Luke chapter 9, verse 48. Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is the least among all of you, this is the one who is great. So the discussion before we even get to verse 50 is, who is the greatest? With Jesus answering, whoever receives the least of these receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. The least is the greatest. Then John, right from the cusp of this lesson from Jesus, brings up an issue probably more than likely because there's a little conviction going on. 
He goes, in verse 49, Master, we, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we, and we try to prevent him because he doesn't follow along with us. And this is God correcting me. As a church, we're called to test to see if things are from God. We're called to. But we should always do it with a heart of humility. Not with an attitude that if it's not the way my church does it, there must be something wrong. But the question still that we need to ask, what should we look for? We are called still to test. Here are some questions we need to rightly ask. What is the attitude? Is it one of humility or is it one of pride? We just sang a song, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you, Jesus. It's not about who? It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. Another question, is sin being opposed? Is the gospel being preached? Are the lies of Satan being exposed? Are people coming to saving faith, trusting in Jesus for salvation? Is Christ being lifted up? If so, listen to the answer that Jesus gives the disciples. Once again, verse 50. Do not stop. Do not hinder him. For he who is not against you is for you. My personal correction. Jesus' name is being proclaimed, and people are starting to talk about him more. This should excite us. That we may be a part of this history now. This should excite us. Yes, there will be some who will take advantage of the excitement and look to make a profit from it. But don't let that hinder the excitement that Jesus' name is being high and lifted up right now. So what is a revival? What is it? A revival is an awakening to spiritual things after a time of slumber. It's a renewal of spiritual fervor. It's an excitement. It is an awakening to spiritual things by the Holy Spirit, giving people eyes to see and ears to hear. So, Is there a revival happening? I would say yes. Why? I'm seeing humility. I'm seeing sin being opposed. The gospel is being preached. The lies of Satan is being exposed. The people are coming to saving faith and trusting in Jesus for salvation. Christ is being lifted up. Now, the next question is, should I go to these areas of revival that are popping up here and there? I would argue, you don't have to. Why? Because the same God who is there is here today. And I believe what God is doing here at Foth and other churches is preparing the congregations of each city for revival, but even more, a reformation, meaning where the culture of our churches and our cities are affected by the lives that are changed by the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Not just a a mere awakening from slumber, but 
a force of change within our churches and city. What kind of change? Where a trust in God is amplified. Faith in God is a driving force of all we do. In other words, no matter what happens, I really believe God's got this. Consider with me again our focus for these past months, prayer life. The question really being, how is your relationship with God? We have defined relationship before. It's based on communication. It's a giving and a receiving of information by two individuals or more and bringing them together. If our relationship with God is nurtured, then we are prepared for revival in our church, in our cities, and in our nation. Here's an illustration. We live up in the mountains here. Many of you have fireplaces. Some of you have gas fireplaces, but others have wood-burning fireplaces. There's a point where the fire dwindles, and what is left are warm pulsating embers. These warm, pulsating embers are awaiting fresh fuel to ignite the fire once again. What is interesting is you can place a new log on top of those embers and nothing really happens. You have pulsating embers and a fresh log sitting on top, maybe smoking. But... But if you blow on those embers, all of a sudden, those embers burn brighter. And with each breath, the intensity of the glow increases to the point where fire ignites. And now it's sufficient to consume the fresh log. And all of a sudden, the fire is ablaze. I say all this as an introduction to the passage of our study. For one purpose alone, praying that today's message would be used by God to ignite the fire. Of revival in the heart of this congregation. That this little church in the hills of Georgia will be one of the many beacons of light shining forth in this age. So, with Bibles in hand, Bible apps ready, Second Chronicles chapter 14. And we're going to do something a little different. Would you all please stand up for the reading of God's Word? And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their lands. The reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. The backdrop of this passage is the completion of the temple in Jerusalem. And Solomon just finished prayer. He's just finished making the prayer of dedication. And a fire came down from heaven and consumed the offering and sacrifice. And the glory of God filled the temple. 
to the point where the priest could not even enter. You want to hear what the reaction of the people was? Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 3. They bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good. Truly he is good. Truly his loving kindness is everlasting. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. <clears throat> then they continue to worship and offer sacrifices unto the Lord for weeks until Solomon sent the people home. And they went home joyful and glad of heart because all that the Lord had done. Sound familiar? It's only on TV. It's only on social media. We're seeing the same thing. The fire was ablaze. It was caught. The people worship, bowed in humility before God. And their thoughts were not on self, but on the character of God. For he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. You see, Solomon had finished the temple. And it was at that time God appeared to Solomon at night, saying to him, I have heard your prayers. And I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. I've heard your prayer. What prayer? The prayer of dedication back in chapter 6, you see. Chapter 6, 14 through 42. But I want to bring your attention to a particular area of the chapter. Chapter 6, 26 through 30. Listen to what it says. When heaven is shut up, pay attention to that. This is Solomon praying to God. When heaven is shut up, and there's no rain because they have sinned against you. If they pray towards this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sins when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sins of your servants, your people Israel. When you teach them the good way in which they should walk and grant rain upon your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. If there is famine in the land, if there's pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar, if there's enemies besieging them in the land and their gates, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever pleas made by any man or by all your people of Israel, each knowing his own affliction and his own sorrow and stretching out his hands towards this house, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and render to each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you, you only know the hearts of the children of mankind, that they may fear you and walk in your ways all the days that they live in the land that you gave our fathers. Notice, Solomon recognized that God's people are prone to sin. Therefore, he petitions, he appeals to God, saying, when heaven is shut, because the people have sinned against you, and they turn to you, hear them. You see, Solomon understood the struggle of man. He understood that we are prone to sin. Therefore, he asks God, please hear. Please hear. Solomon understood mankind was in need of much grace, much mercy. Guess what? We're still prone to sin and need 
of much grace and much mercy. Nothing has changed. Solomon understood the consequence of sin. Listen to Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. It helps us define those consequences. Uh, but it's your iniquities, your sins that have separated, has made separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not, what? Hear. What does sin do? It causes separation between you and God. So his face is hidden, and he doesn't hear you. Solomon understood this truth. He understood the condition of man. He understood, like the song that I brought up, the last sermon I, I preached here, Come Thou Fount of Ever Blessing. It goes like this, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to what? Prone to what? Wander. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Do you feel it? Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Solomon understood the condition of man. He understood how Israel in the past would wander to be restored by God, only to wander away again, needing to be restored yet once more. He understood the plight of man. And our daily, let me repeat that, our daily need of salvation. So we prayed, when your people sin, because I know they will, because I know I will. And when we repent, when we turn back to you, hear from heaven. So here in chapter 7, God appears to him and says, I've heard your prayer. I've heard your petition. I've heard your appeal. Now let's go back to chapter 7 once again and listen to God's response to Solomon's prayer. But let's start with verse 13. Verse 13, when I shut heaven when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people and my people who are called by my name. You know what? And another version in verse 14 says, and if, if, and if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then... I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their lands. This is what you call a conditional statement. If then, if this, then that. If this, then that. So for the remainder of our time, I want to focus on those three conditions. Humbling ourselves, praying and seeking the face of God, and turning from our wicked ways. You see, Solomon knew that the fervor of the dedication of the temple, the excitement, the response would wane and the people would become once again focused on self. 
And with the focus on self comes an opportunity to sin. In other words, the fire would dwindle and begin to grow cold and would be in need of a stoking to expose those embers, those pulsating remnants of the fire which burned so brightly, readied for the breath of God to bring it ablaze once again. That fire needed to be maintained. In other words, when we have taken focus off God and placed it upon self, we have allowed the mundaneness of daily life to steal our burning passion for God. And we, you and me, may be in need of a shaking, a poking, the stoking to expose those burning embers that will be readied for revival. I propose if we as a church want to be readied for the sake of our families, our churches, our nation, we need to take heed of this conditional statement given to God's people who are called by his name. Christian. Take heed. Why? Because I believe as a people, as a church, we have allowed ourselves to grow cold and allowed the love of this life to overshadow our love for God, causing us to grow cold. Let's look at these conditions individually now. Number one, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves. We already touched on what humility looks like through my confession, huh? Remember Luke chapter 9? The greater than you argument between the disciples? Think about how that argument must have gone. Do you know what I did for Jesus? Do you know what I left for Jesus? Do you know how much I've given to Jesus? Do you know? Do you know? Do you know what I did? Picture with me once again, Jesus picking up that child. A child without status, without position, without power, without much understanding. Not worth your time in the eyes of society. Jesus brings this one close to him as they're far off arguing you want to be greater? You want to be greater then? Then be this way. Be without status in your eyes. Without position in your own eyes. Without power in your own eyes. Without haughtiness. Because knowledge can puff up. You must consider yourself of no importance in the eyes of society. You want to be greater? Look to the child. Look to the child who's praying for your safety. This is the proper attitude Jesus calls us to. If my people would humble themselves, why, why this condition? Because we think much of ourselves. If you don't agree with that statement, here's a test. Next time you get angry and get into an argument, ask yourself, why am I getting angry? More than likely, you're not getting something that you want, or something's been taken away from you, or you're not getting your way. We think much of ourselves. Psalm chapter 10, verse 3 and 4. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. 
And all his thoughts are, there is no God. When we think much of ourselves, God is not in the picture. When we think much of ourselves, that's called pride. We are in need of humility because without humility, we would not seek after God. Pride keeps you unaware of your sinful condition. If you are unaware of your sinful condition, then you will not see your need of a Savior. You will not see a need for God because your focus is on your own desire. Pride resists the will of God. Pride says, my will be done. Pride upholds its own word above the word of God. Pride is a work of the flesh and therefore opposes all things God. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, their own desires. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit, God's desires. But to set the mind on flesh is... Let's try that again. To set the mind on flesh is... But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and Peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Humility is a condition given to Israel, given to you and me, given to we, because humility breaks down the barrier of pride and paves the way to submission to the truth of the Word of God. Humility is where God's will is not resisted. Humility is where your desire becomes God's will to be done. And the word of God is honored above your own. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Humility gives you a sober outlook of your condition, where your eyes are open to your sinful estate, so that you see your need of a Savior. If my people will humble themselves, Let's take a moment before we move forward and pray that the Lord would cause this condition to take root in our heart. Lord, we pray that you would cause us as a congregation to be humble of heart for the sake of our relationship with you and for the sake of our relationship with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Humility is a doorway to communication. If my people who are called by my name, Christian, humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Again, humility is a doorway to communication. As we are humbled, we are aware of our sinful condition, and that brings us to a place where we're ready to communicate, ready to pray, ready to seek the face of God. Communication, once again, 
requires a giver and a taker, a receiver and a responder. Our good friends at Webster defines it like this. The act or process of using words, sounds, signs, or behaviors to express or exchange information or to express your ideas, thoughts, and feelings to someone else. How many of you know if you're self-focused and prideful, there's not much communication happening? There's a lot of one-sided demands, but not communication. But we humble ourselves. That's a doorway where communication is opened. And we know that communication is the building blocks of a relationship. If we humble ourselves and pray, this is communication. I'm speaking to God. If we humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face, this is diligently pressing in to encounter the presence of God. You know, when I want my children to really hear what I'm saying, I say to them, look at me in the eyes. Not just for negative circumstances, but also for positive situations. Because I don't just want them to hear my words, I want them to hear my heart. When we pray, we communicate with God, and when we seek His face, we are after the heart of God. You're seeking intimacy with God. You're seeking His will, His word for your life today. I love that God gives us physical illustrations of the concepts of what communication relationships are. You've heard me say before that the concept of marriage is what we're talking about with this whole thing of, of prayer and communication. You, do you know that the church is called the bride of Christ? So consider this. In a marriage, there must be communication. There must be a mutual exchange of information for communication to occur. So both man and woman must engage emotionally, verbally, physically, if that's not going out, if that's not happening, there's no relationship. So lack of communication in marriage promotes relational distance. A love that's growing colder. You get it? If communication in the marriage is lacking, then you'll find a lack of intimacy. You hear what I just said? I'm going to say it again. If communication in marriage is lacking, then you'll find a lack of intimacy in a marriage. If communication is thriving, intimacy abounds. And the fire burns brightly. That fire must be maintained. Are you taking notes, man? I think I need to take some notes. Just being honest. A burning ember readied for revival is one that is humble, that prays and seeks the heart of God. Let's take a moment before we move forward and pray that the Lord would cause this condition to take root in our heart. Lord, would you grant us a willing spirit to want to pray and want to seek your face? Because, Lord, there are many times when we just don't want to. Lord, would you ignite in us a hunger for your kingdom and your righteousness? Ignite in us a want to, to seek your face more than the things of this world. 
In Jesus' name, amen. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Turn with me now to 1 John chapter 1. 8 through 10. That's 1 John 1, 8 through 10. I want to show you that the principle that we see here in 2 Chronicles is the same principle that we see in the New Testament. Listen on. If, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Pride says, I have no sin. Pride makes God out to be a liar. And where there's pride... God's word does not dwell. Humility leads to confession, which is prayer and seeking after his face. The result of humility and confession is a display of God's faithfulness to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, humility is the doorway to communication which leads to repentance. Repentance begins with the acknowledgement of our wrongdoing and a turning back to God. Remember, this is God answering Solomon's prayer, Solomon's petition, his appeal, because he understood the condition of man. He understood man's fickle heart wandering from God, only to be restored by God, only to wander once again, to be restored, and so on and so forth. He understood the plight of man and man's need of daily salvation. So when your people sin because I know they will, because I know I will. And when we repent, when we turn back to you, hear us, hear us. So what is repentance? Repentance is when we turn back to God from our wicked ways. We cannot turn from our wicked ways if we don't know what wicked ways are. Turn with me now to John chapter 16, 8 and 9. John chapter 16, 8 and 9. And when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they did not believe in me. It is God's Spirit that convicts the world concerning its sin and concerning righteousness, concerning righteousness that can only be found in Christ Jesus alone. Now look with me at Psalm chapter 139, 23 and 24. The psalmist is basically defining the work of the Spirit in the life of the believer. God's Spirit searches, He searches the hearts to see if there is any wicked ways so that we may turn from them and turn to him. So that we confess our sins knowing that he is righteous and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us away from all unrighteousness. So it's God's spirit who convicts the world of sin and righteousness. And here's the psalmist saying, search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting. The way 
of everlasting is turning to God, seeking his provision of salvation by placing your trust in Jesus. Where is your trust today, Christian? Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, that I will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in Democrats, some trust in Republicans, but I'll trust in the name of the Lord my God. Some trust in their 401k, some trust, you get it. Where's your trust today, Christian? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, speaking concerning repentance. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. I'm going to go ahead and say that again. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Another verse that comes to my mind, it's not going to be up there because it's in here. Romans 8, 28. For this we know, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God works out all things for the good for those who love him. It means everything, and every, every mistake that we made, God can bring purpose to them. That's hope, isn't it? Why wouldn't you want to turn to Jesus? For a godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, where the worldly grief produces death. Godly grief causes you to turn to Jesus. Earthly grief causes you to turn to self. Would you listen right now? If you're grieving right now about your wrongdoing, if you have a sin that you're holding on to, Turn to Jesus. Stop turning to yourself. You can't pay for your own sins. Jesus paid it all. Let's take a moment before we move forward and pray the Lord would cause this condition to take root in our hearts. Lord, search our hearts, know our thoughts our actions, and reveal to us how we are sinning against you. Lord, search our hearts, know our thoughts, our actions, and reveal to us how we are sinning against others. Lord, search our hearts, know our thoughts, our actions, and reveal our wants and desires. Show us where our desires have become selfish ambition, which has led us away from you. In Jesus' name. If my people who are called by my name, Christian, humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, remember, this is a conditional statement, if this, then that, Let's look at the then, then, shall we? Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. January, we started discussing the importance of prayer, our prayer life. And with the focus on prayer life comes a reigniting of a passion to draw close to Jesus. To draw close to Jesus relationally. Notice with me, there's no relationship apart from humility, humbling ourselves. There's no relationship apart from communication, praying and seeking God's face. And there's no relationship apart from taking responsibility for our actions, turning from our wicked ways. The call to prayer is a call to humility, a call to communication, a call to repentance. It's a call to come to Jesus, your Savior, 
for forgiveness of sin so that you can be reconciled with God and being reconciled with God, able to interact with your God. I propose if we as a church want to be those burning embers readied for revival, readied for the sake of our families, our churches, our nation, we need to take heed of these conditional statements and cultivate, maintain our relationship with God and not allow our hearts to grow cold. Let the fire of revival begin in your heart. Let the breath of God blow on those embers of your life to burn brighter with each given breath of the Spirit. Let the intensity of the glow increase to the point where the fire ignites and is sufficient to consume a fresh log and ignite it ablaze where our attitude is one of humility, where sin is opposed, where the gospel is proclaimed, where the lives of Satan are exposed, where we are coming to a saving faith and trusting in Jesus for salvation, where we lift Christ high and lift it up. John chapter 12, verse 32. And I, if I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. That's revival. If Christ is lifted up, he will draw people to himself. I end today's sermon with a verse from Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Pray with me. Father God, these are your words. It's your scripture. It's your spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would have your way with us. Lord, We confess that we haven't sought after you as we should. That we have allowed our relationships to wane. Lord, would you set us afire again? We are called by your name. We are your church. We are called Christian. And I pray, Lord, that we would represent that name rightly. Your name, Jesus. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your name would be high and lifted up in our own lives. And as your name is high and lifted up in our own lives, that you would draw people to you. Help us to step away, step aside, so that we can make your glory seen. Cause us to be a beacon of light. 